Okay, so I just introduced the concept of random forest as the, uh, the building of a large number of independently grown regression trees uh, based on bootstrap samples and sampling of predictors. So now let's see it quickly in action. And again, uh, what you see in the software, I mean, right before I built only a single regression tree, and we knew that it had about 72% R squared or something like that. So now let's go ahead and build uh, a random forest model. So again, I do the model setup here. It's a regression run. My analysis engine will be random forests. Uh, on the testing side, I'll use out-of-bag data, which means it's kind of similar to cross-validation, except that it relies on out-of-bag data. And the random forest itself has a very simple set of settings. So I'll build 200 trees. Uh, I will look at, in this case, at four predictors randomly sampled at each node, because overall I have about 16 or so, so the square root from that is four. And I will allow parent nodes to have as few as two records, which is the recommended setting for random forest. So then I click Start. Uh, as you can see, the process uh, developed very quickly. The end result of it is you have this mean squared error curve. Now, random forest has a lot of randomness associated with it, so you will never see nice and smooth curves. They will always be similar to, uh, like uh, as Leo Bryman once said, it's as if you're tossing a coin and counting the number of heads. So the overall, uh, the percentage of heads converges to 0.5, but it doesn't do it in a nice and smooth way. So you have this statistical stochastic. Then the same thing happens in random forest. As you look at this curve, uh, by the time it developed about 50 trees, it already reached the level of mean squared error that is stationary. And then from that point on, it just continues doing its job over and over again. And uh, this way, you can see that the process has converged. Now, when you click on the summary button, you can actually see some of the summaries. Now, no, most notably is that you have R squared now going into the 88% uh, cent range, which you remember in the case of Mars, we moved from 74% to 88%. Same thing happens here with the random forest model. We improved on the predictive response of a single tree from 72% up to 88%. That's the real advantage of using multiple trees. Now, what did we lose? We lost the ability to visually see and inspect the model itself. Like when you look at the variable importance here, you see that the same variables are still being used, like LSTAT, RM, and OX, same variables, but we lost a direct ability to interpret our model. You're still getting very small residuals and all of that, but the key is that now we have a very nice predictive accuracy. Now, when people build random forest model, they do it for two reasons. Number one, it's a very powerful variable uh, uh, selector. So when you have uh, a situation, when you have tens of thousands of predictors and you run random forest model on that data set, what you will often discover is that the top set of, say, 50 or 100 variables that are relevant so you do random forest run as a variable selection, variable filtering routine that incorporates interactions, nonlinearities, all sorts of signal complexity. And the number two, you want something that has a very high predictive accuracy. So in this case, it is confirmed by the R squared measures. And uh, in my case, I could switch quickly into the score button and say, okay, here's my data set or pick a new data set. And I'll just say save. Uh, the output data set is Boston score underscore say RF random forest and then I click score and it went ahead and proceeded by scoring my data set so now I have my predicted responses that are highly accurate and it's based on 88 percent R squared and as you can see in general this is the the type of the things that you can do with the random forest, uh, and um, it, it's very neat in the sense that you don't have to do anything. You just open the data set, you say how many trees you're trying to grow, 
uh, it's how much time you're willing to spend uh, or resource because each tree computes time that uh, takes time and also some resources to be saved and uh, after that uh, you just need to select the number of predictors to sample at each node and let it run. Now it may take a while to get the results, but once you get the results you'll see exactly which variables are relevant and you can also have something manageable to score future data. Now the disadvantage of random forest is that uh, it takes a long time to and compute resources and it also produces very large trees. So when you deal with very large data sets, sometimes it becomes awkward to use random forest directly because it will run too long and it will also consume too much space on a hard drive or in your computer memory. So whenever that happens, uh, in other words, when you have a very large data set, there is an alternative approach that I'm going to talk about next. And it's known as stochastic gradient boosting. And you will find that the stochastic gradient boosting will be a lot more convenient and useful as far as modeling medium size to large data sets. It still gives you the same accuracy as random forest and sometimes even more. It also has a second biggest advantage, which is the great advantage, which is a way that it allows you to understand what's going on and interpret, interpret your signal.